This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is Ghana land and we wish to express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors. And acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Ghana people have with their traditional land. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here to our presentation from Bush Food to Banjan Borani, Food, Family and History on a Plate. The Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia is pleased to be presenting tonight's event as part of the inaugural Adelaide Food Fringe. And I would like to thank founder and director, Vic Pisani, for his wonderful work in bringing tonight's event to fruition. Also, a very warm welcome to our speakers and thank you, everyone, for your time, energy, and for creating a very rich, as we're going to find out, a very rich tapestry of food, culture, and history for South Australia and beyond. It is now my pleasure to invite Vic Pisani, Director of Adelaide Food French, who will say a few words. Thank you, Vic. Uh, thanks, Jacinta, and um, thanks to the Hawke Centre for hosting this and um, fascinating talk and, and all of our fascinating panellists here today. I'd also like to pay my respects to Ghana elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the Ghana people as not only the traditional owners and custodians of the land but also the uh, traditional uh, owners and the, of the oldest living food culture mm. in the world. Um, this talk is all about food, so we'll be hearing more about that from Mark soon. Um, if you're not familiar with the Adelaide uh, Food Fringe, we're a brand new open access festival that exists to celebrate and support food and beverage businesses and communities all around the state. Um, our 10 year, 10 year, our 10 day festival began last Friday <laughs> and finishes 10 year. That would be a great festival. <laughs> yeah. Next year will be 10 years, yeah. Um, so we began Friday and finished this Sunday and uh, in our program you'll find 150 events right across the state uh, like dinners, breakfast, lunches, cooking classes, tours, picnics, all kinds of experiences in restaurants, bars, wineries, cafes, pubs, universities, migrant community clubs, distilleries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and the beauty of our festival is it's 100%, it's not curated by me, it's not about my favourite things, it's 100% curated by all of the food and beverage businesses and communities that register their event. So it's a fantastic representation of, of what we have here in South Australia. I've been blown away by the, the depth and breadth of the program, but the thing that gives me most pride about our festival is the, the cultural diversity that's represented within there. Um, there's 22 different cultures and cuisines represented from uh, the Ghana nation, it Italian, French, Latvian, and Greek to Korean, Japanese, Sierra Leonean, Indian, Afghan, Venezuelan, and, and many more different cultures. Um, this in itself tells us something really wonderful about what food culture is in Australia today. And also that everyone's idea of food culture uh, in our country is different, and, but it's also just as relevant and it can't be prescribed by celebrity chefs or food trends. Um, my, my background, I grew up in a, an Italian family myself and the importance of food to my cultural her heritage is very strong. Every single member of my family on both sides came to Australia from a historic port town in Puglia called Molfetta. Um, 
So my Italian Australian identity is is clearly in my bloodline, but growing up as a first generation Australian, it was nurtured and instilled in me through language, food, and most importantly, the, the family recipes that the matriarchs in my family brought here to Australia when they migrated here. Um, like most Italian families, the dads and the nonos were great eaters, but they weren't great cooks. <laughs> um, so our mums and our nonas were very much the custodians of our family history through the food that they shared with, with their families. And as a kid, I didn't realise how powerful these family recipes were and the stories that my family attached to them were until I became much older and... Um, took my family to Mulfetta and when we got there the, the, the smells, the, the flavours and the food seemed to instantly flick a switch in, in, in my head and my heart that made, made me feel deep down like I belonged somewhere else other than Australia um, and I, I really felt that and I'm sure um, our panellists here will talk about that connection as well. Um, like most migrant families um, coming to Australia. My family's cultural story is is unique, but it's also very common um, in that they've maintained their... Uh, well, we've maintained our, our heritage through an oral history where the food has always been a key mechanism in communicating this oral history and passing down that knowledge and culture and family history to the next generation. Um, as well as welcoming other people into our culture as well. It's always through food. Um, and all of the, the panel here today are, are amazing examples of, of this power of food, wine and spirits, of course, um, in informing us of, of who we are and, and where we've come from. And I can't wait to hear their stories here tonight. So thank you for coming and thank you for listening to my festival plug. <laughs> I know you're all here to listen to these wonderful people, so I'll pass it on to Deb and, and thank you for thank you again for coming. Thanks very much, Vic, and congratulations on a wonderful event that is so inclusive and diverse and accessible and affordable. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Jacinta, for hosting the event tonight. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and I'd also like to recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture, and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to pay respect to anybody else um, with the cultural authority of an Aboriginal uh, background who's joining us uh, in here tonight or via the um, video recording. A very special welcome to everybody that is joining us tonight. It's so lovely to see so many people out on what's been one of the coldest days we've had so far here in Adelaide for a while. For this wonderful discussion and to hear stories about family and food, and it's important to cultural heritage, identity and understanding. And it's great to see so many young people here in the audience as well. We've got a wonderful panel of guests from different backgrounds and individual cultural experiences of family and and food, and each one of them has been shaped by the part that food has played in their own lives, in the culture in which they've been raised, and in the way they, in turn, have lived their lives. And in turn, they've enriched our lives, of course, and our cultural life, and have helped us to create a more tolerant and diverse nation. Now, each guest has got a fascinating story to tell, and I'll let them do that, but I'm going to paint you a bit of a thumbnail sketch of, of all of our guests tonight. I'd like to start with Enos Petriti. Enos is director and shareholder of her award-winning family winery, Petriti & Co. Enos' father, Giovanni, emigrated to Adelaide from a poor rural area of Italy in 1925. And by 1926, he was already planning and planting the family winery at its present-day site in suburban Dover Gardens, which I think was a long way from the centre of things at the time. Uh, Enos' mother, Nella, migrated to Melbourne in 1938, and that same year she met and married Giovanni. They had four children, 
three boys, and finally a girl, Enos. So she's the baby of the family. (laughs) Along with her three older brothers, Peter, John, and Jeff, Enos has spent her entire working life in the family business. And now a new generation of Petriti family is involved in the business, including Enos' sons, Matthew, and senior winemaker, James. I think Giovanni uh, would be very proud of you. Please welcome Enos. George Georgiadis is co-founder and managing director of Never Never Distilling Co, which makes Australia's most highly awarded gins. All four of George's grandparents were born in Greece and migrated to Australia. His Greek heritage has ensured that George has always been surrounded by food, and he learnt at a young age that quality ingredients and process are key to flavour. Believe it or not, George had a career in banking and finance before he became a gin distiller in 2016. He particularly enjoyed making an ouzo style product that pays homage to his mum's uh, home island of Lesbos. And George has told me that if he hadn't started a gin distillery, he'd probably be making sheep's milk cheese. Glad you're making gin, but thanks for joining us, George. <laughs> Dakani Ayubi was born in Afghanistan, an historic place in the heart of Central Asia, at the meeting point of ancient trade routes known as the Silk Road. At the age of two, Dakani and her family at the time, three sisters, were forced by conflict to flee Afghanistan to a refugee camp before locating to Australia in 1987. Many centuries of ancient knowledge and history were passed to Dakani's mother, Farida, the family matriarch. And in fact, Farida became chef of the family's much-loved Pawana restaurant, which opened its doors to us, thankfully, in 2009. Now, Dakani studied chemistry, had a career as a policy analyst in Canberra, before returning to her roots and her heritage in the family's food business to reconnect with her history. Since then, the family has continued its fusion of food and culture, opening the city kitchen Kuchi, where Dakani cooks, and she has written her first book, Pawana, Recipes and Stories from an Afghan Kitchen, which reflects on the relationship between food, place, history, culture, and rolling identities. Please welcome Dakani. Cordelia Clay was also driven by war from her home in Sierra Leone. With her children and grandchildren, she migrated to Australia as a refugee over 12 years ago. Cordelia possesses great passion for cooking and has taken a lead in showcasing her culture, sharing the flavours of the Sierra Leonean kitchen to the wider Australian community through such things as her cooking demonstrations at the Adelaide Central Market. Supporting people, particularly refugees, making them feel loved and wanted is particularly important to her. Cordelia knows that people from Sierra Leone may never have the opportunity to return. Some of them may not have seen traditional foods prepared and may not have had the opportunity to cook them themselves. Cordelia is keeping those traditions alive from Africa here in Adelaide. Please welcome Cordelia. Mark Kulmatry, well, we are all, at least those of us up here on the stage, migrants to Aboriginal Elder Mark Kulmatry's country. Like all First Nations people, Mark is part of the oldest continuous culture on earth. Mark grew up uh, in and around the Raukan community on the shores of Lake Alexandrina in South Australia, also, of course, well known as the home of inventor David Uniapon, whose likeness is featured on our $50 note. After colonisation, Mark's ancestors faced dispossession, displacement, exploitation and violence that still resonates today. But Mark himself is passionate about cultural heritage, about education and the protection of his people's right to thrive. Mark's an educator, researcher, cultural leader, tourism operator and chair of the State Aboriginal Heritage Committee, the peak body of the protection of cultural heritage here in South Australia. Please welcome Mark. (laughs) Now, I would like to, I've, I've given a thumbnail sketch of your lives, but I would like you to really share with us the stories of your life. Tell us a few stories about where you grew up 
how your culture has affected your identity. Um, and I'd like to start with you, please, Mark. No worries. So first of all, welcome everyone here. It's great to be here tonight with you all and sharing this. As Deb said, I grew up in and around the community called Rakan, which prior to 1974 was known as Port Maclay Mission. But now it's called Rakan. Rakan means meeting place. So during my childhood growing up, there was an abundance amount of water. So with it come lots of callop, lots of brim, catfish, lots of foods were there. Um, so it was easy to teach and learn from the old people, all the knowledge of food and culture that comes with it. So food is just not a separate entity that stuck out on a rock somewhere. It is a part of all of our upbringing, of our learning, of our heritage of who we are and that appreciation. Now we know now that there's been droughts. The water is not coming to us. So as a result of that, one of the things that's really been affected is something we call our nyachi or our totem. So the plants are not there. The food is not there. The, we don't even, I don't even know what a callop looks like anymore or a brim or a catfish. So all of that has been taken away from us those traditions of our women going out collecting foods, our men being able to hunt and gather, all of that, that whole tradition has been taken away and it started when we talked about colonisation, but it's over a period of time where we are right now, that sharing that can be done about around food is no longer there. So one of the things that, you know, I, I like eating things like swan and Cape Barren geese and collecting foods, um, but, but the, the, the ability to do that is no longer there. The ability to share that is no longer there. So as Deb said about me being chair also of State Aboriginal Heritage, it's about that protection of everything that is heritage and what does heritage really mean. So I've been working alongside, uh, including my whole committee, along the South Australian Heritage Council, looking at all things heritage, to come up with something that fits that what is a model for South Australia today of looking at heritage. Um, so, look, I've done many, many things. I wear many, many hats. Um, but, like, yeah, it certainly is a pleasure to be here and to share some of this and to talk through it. Um, but I'm also impressed to listen to other people's stories. And, you know, that although we, as a traditional owner of many parts, it's also great to know that we now live in a multicultural society where this belongs to all of us. Thanks, Mark. Cordelia, we really only know what we, uh, many of us, know what we know about Sierra Leone from hearing about conflict there. Yeah. Now, you grew up there up until 12 years ago when you moved here to Australia. Tell us about what life is like for you in Sierra Leone and, and how the culture is important to your identity. Um, yes, life in Sierra Leone is very beautiful. We were happy before the war came in Sierra Leone. And during the war, it was very hard. It was very difficult for us because they take young um, kids to become rebels, give them gun, um, feed them with drugs so they don't know what they are doing. And then they were killing innocent people, burning down houses, amputate hands. So because of that, it's get a point where um, we have to make a decision to flee the country because of the kids. So we fled to um, Conakry, Guinea, where we seek refuge. I was there in Guinea for about five and a half years. And then we heard about this um, program from UNHCR, which we applied. My son was the um, applicant, so we applied for it, and then we came to Australia. But life in Sierra Leone, when we were growing up, we are all united as a family with our parents. They teach us how to cook when they're in the kitchen. We are there with them. We do all do the preparation together. 
and then from there we, you go out, you learn how to cook little by little. So it's the same thing I pass on to my own kids and even now to my grandkids that we are here in Australia. So food is important to us because food brings us all together and we don't eat separately back home in Sierra Leone. We all eat in one dish and you know that unity is there when you do that and then um, so it's, it's really good for us for the cultural um, things that we teach our children and we bring it here to in Australia. Thanks Cordelia. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Dakani, you were only two when you left Afghanistan, but of course your parents had spent their lives there. Can you tell us if there is anything that you remember of it, but how um, that being the place that you were born has had such an impact on not just your identity, but in fact the way you've lived your life? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here, and um, it's just such a pleasure to be sharing this stage with the wonderful guests sitting beside me. Um, I would say, well, so yes, I was born in Afghanistan um, at the height of the Cold War um, in the mid-80s, um, and that was a time of significant trauma um, for Afghanistan, and um, it's basically a period that um, it's not recovered from since. Uh, and it was a time when over half of the country's population had either been killed or was sent into exile. Um, and this was all because of Cold War tensions playing out between Soviet Russia and the United States. And you know, these, this is history repeating itself in Afghanistan, really. So we've got this long history of people kind of trying to come in and, and take over the region for all sorts of political, geopolitical re um, reasons. So my family was one of millions displaced um, at the time. And um, really, even though I don't remember, obviously, that kind of initial um, moment of that severance, um, it's something that has shaped my life. Um, we came to Australia as a very young family via a refugee camp in Pakistan, um, where we spent under a year and eventually migrated over to um, Australia. But it basically defined the trajectory of my life because all of a sudden life was about this disconnection, this severance from ancestral history and everything that was known for my parents. So for my sisters and I, there were four of us at the time and we were all really quite young. Um, so our experience of that displacement and that exile is very different to my parents because they have basically been disconnected from lived memories, things that they were there on country, on land, with their own ancestral memories, with, with their, their family, their kin around them, and living and breathing the culture. Um, and then obviously in Australia, it shifts to a place of reconstruction. And food played a huge part of what that connection, that tether to our own history, our own ancestral memories, our identity was preserved and kind of food formed the seeds that germinated in our lives um, as young children to stay connected to our ancestry. Um, so really it's, apart from things like food and, and that language, because my sisters and I all speak um, Farsi as it was our first language, um, these were kind of the pieces of identity that were scrapped together to, to stay connected to that heritage. Um, and I would say that um, the way it's impacted me and my identity as I've grown up is I've become more and more interested in what that lost history is because I've understood as I've grown up that so much of my life is about absences and it's about silences and eviscerations and it's because of the layers of um, representation. It's about power and representation and for a country like Afghanistan um, with such little self-representation uh, it's become so much more important to me to stay very anchored to that history, to know who I am, to know who my ancestors were, so that I can, not so I can live in the past, but so that I can contribute to my present and to my future with meaning and with direction. And food has, in hindsight, you know, from being little girls with my mum in the kitchen, um, not really understanding that 
that food was that link to our ancestry, and my mum called it a treasure that she was keeping to pass on to us. And the full meaning of the value of that treasure keeps playing out in my life as I'm getting older and older. Mm. Wonderful. Thanks, Dakota. Now, George, you haven't had the direct experience of, of migrating from another country, but all four of your grandparents came from Greece. So tell us about your cultural connection to Greek culture here in Australia. Yeah, thanks, Deb, and um, lovely to be here in such great company. Uh, I guess it's a, you know, it's, it's a fairly common story in a way um, uh, of, of um, European-Australian migration. So my four grandparents were uh, from different parts of Greece, one side of the family from the island of Lesbos, which is very close to Turkey, um, my mum's family, uh, and then my dad's family partly from the, the north uh, near Thessaloniki and partly from the south of the mainland near Kalamata. Um, and you know, all arriving in, uh, in Adelaide uh, by boat at a time in the 50s where, um, you know, all of that was just starting. So I guess the family history is, is one of, um, of that experience of um, development in um, Australia and integration with Australian culture and then pr preservation of Greek culture. So I uh, got the joy of 11 years of Greek school uh, uh, and everything that came along with that. Um, uh, but it, it is um, a, wonderful, a wonderful way to stay connected to culture through language and of course through food. Um, I think the, um, probably the, main, the most striking thing about Greek culture that I think I think stays with me today is there's this word called philotimor which is very hard to translate into English. It's sort of a combination of an honor code, um, generosity, hospitality, doing the right thing, um, and definitely the, the hospitality and generosity bit is the, the piece that stayed with me the strongest. The idea of um, being welcoming and, welcoming and generous to anyone who work, walks through your door, making sure people have a great time. Um, and without a doubt, that's the bit that has um, uh, sort of peaked an in interest in, in the food and beverage industry and the hospitality industry for me is just that ability to create a, um, an impact and, and joy through you know, a sensory experience. So that's, um, that's uh, you know, direct... Um, product of that upbringing. Um, and I think, you know, the, um, a wonderful opportunity to be able to demonstrate what, what family demonstrated to me mm -hmm. all through those years. Thanks, George. Ines, we heard that your father, Giovanni, only arrived in 25, and by 26, he was starting at least to make wine. So tell us about why wine and what he brought from Ab Italy. And Absolutely essential. <laughs> if you have a meal, you have a glass of wine. There's no, no two ways about <laughs> it. So that's why he would have <clears throat> begun making wine for his own use. And then, of course, there was a small Italian population at that time, um, and uh, Slavic, you know, people that were used to having wine with their meals. So by word of mouth, it became, it then turned into a commercial venture. Um, I was born here, um, as was uh, mentioned before, to Italian immigrants, and um, I can understand now that um, we all have our own uh, journeys. My father left his part of Italy, Piemonte, um, because there were rumblings, political rumblings he didn't like there, and maybe he had problems with his family, I don't know. Um, but my mother has always said that I'm a hard head just like your father, so uh, <laughs> testadura is the term that she used whenever I wasn't doing what she wanted me to do. And then my mother, of course, um, was far more impoverished. She came from um, Arcade, which is just an hour out of um, Venice. Now, she did live in poverty. They were uh, contadini, or peasant farmers, and um, hunger played a huge role in her life. And she only actually learnt um, cooking and food when she went to Geneva as a, uh, a maid and a governess. But that's another story. So I was born downtown um, Dover Gardens, uh, the daughter after three sons. And I actually attended school knowing very few words of, of Australian, of English. 
So much was the uh, community that was at the winery site at that time. My mother never, um, she lived to 88 and a half and really had minimal English because unfortunately we translated for her, the people around her uh, did that. She could swear really well in Australian, but for <laughs> other English, you know. Um, but certainly food played a huge part in our family life and it still does. And the memories of my mother's food still, you know, um, she was an amazing, amazing woman and her food was an amazing story as well. And I'm so privileged that um, my sons know how to cook and especially one has really got her gift. Mm. And it just, when it, we, we get together, food's so important in the sharing and then of course the flavours and tastes that you said brings it all back. It just does. And wine helps, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Enos. Um, Mark, earlier you mentioned um, women collecting, men hunting, and Enos, you talk about your mum doing the cooking. So I'd like to explore the issue of gender in culture and in cooking, because I'd like to know its place. And if I could start with you, Ines, because um, you've had three brothers and a dad, yeah. and lots of people working on the, the property, yeah. growing grapes, picking yeah. grapes, yeah. making wine. Mm. Um, I imagine it was quite male. What, what was the sort of gender breakdown of who did the cooking Certainly, and what the roles uh, were? My father from 25 to 38 was a very good cook and actually taught mum some Piedmontese dishes. Very different. The thing is that you've got to remember about Italy and I'm sure other countries, we have regions and the regional food is very different and it's really quite interesting. But hers was Vanitor um, area. But then of course, marriage took place and when she came to the site, she was the cook. <laughs> cook, bottle washer and everything else in between. And uh, when it came to food, and this is breakfast, lunch and tea, the men would be called in and they would have, um, there's a kitchen and like a dining room. They would come in and sit down and we women, mum and I, when I was old enough, uh, would serve them. We would serve them and if they asked for a salt or another piece of bread or whatever, we would attend to their needs. We would remove their plates, even to their glasses. They just got up because they were working, you see. Us women were not working as such. <laughs> and off they would go back to work. And that's just the way it was. They sat out there, mum and I sat in the kitchen and we would listen out to what their requirements were. That's how I grew up. And when they left the table, you know, I would remove the dishes, um, shake the tablecloth, sweep the floors, help mum with the dishes. And that went on for years and years and years. But my sons all know how to cook. I was <laughs> not going to let that happen in that generation, so. Wow, mm. that's fascinating. Now, I'm going to go to the women first, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, Cordelia, what sort of gender roles are there in, the, in cooking in Sierra Leone? Well, for us in Sierra Leone, mostly it's the girls that do the cooking. The wives do the cooking. The men, they hardly cook. <laughs> yeah, it's the women. It's our responsibility that women own the kitchen. So the women do the cooking. The men can help like in cleaning, you know, decorating the house, those kind of stuff, they can do that. But for cooking, it's us. We take it as our responsibility. So when we are co cooking, the, our kids, the male ones, they, don't, they are not in the kitchen with us, only the girls. They do the housework, the cleaning, make sure everything is clean and ready. But for the girls, they are in the kitchen with us. They learn how to cook in the kitchen. But when I came over to Australia, I find out that um, cooking is also for boys as well and men because you have professional chefs that mm. are men. So I started passing it on to my grandkids. Okay. So for my own kids, like my son, he doesn't know how to cook. <laughs> yeah, that's one I can tell you for sure. He doesn't know how to cook. <laughs> <But> <laughs> and even the oldest grandson, only here in Australia, he learned how to do some Australian food, but our typical African dish, they don't know how to do it. <laughs> That's why I'm passing it on now to my grandkids that were born here. Because um, cooking is a profession. You can be a qualified chef. So now I involve them in my cooking in the kitchen. Good to hear. <laughs> 
Dukhani. Yeah, um, I find this really interesting, and um, I just can't help but see it through so many lenses, because there's, obviously when you talk about gender, we're talking about equality. And gender roles are very different from in non-Western cultures, and the association of being in a kitchen is different in non-Western cultures than it might be in anglicised cultures. Um, we didn't have the phenomena of housewives desperate to escape the house, you know, that is a gendered role that's a part of the Western world because of consumerism and capitalism and everything that came along with it. So my understanding of gender and roles is quite different, you know. Um, but that's not to say that women don't do back-breaking work everywhere in the world with little gratitude and gratification for it. And yeah, that's definitely a part of Afghan um, identity today. And I would say that it's really inseparable from the last four decades of war that's devastated the place. <laughs> you know, uh, there's patriarchy rules. And um, is that part of my cultural identity? I don't know, <laughs> you know? And so when I think about it, I try to think about it in deconstructed ways um, and separate out those layers of things that have been imposed upon us and told, us, told to us that that's what our identity is. And if I could just give some examples, within my own family, my mum learnt how to cook from her dad. And my brother-in-law is one of the cooks that works with my mum in the restaurant. And he comes from a family of Afghan men who pickle and preserve and cook, and there's no shame in it. But you know, how does Afghan culture manifest today after decades of war and interruption? I'm sure there's, that patriarchy plays a huge role in it. Um, in my own family, I'm one of five girls, and <laughs> we're lucky we didn't have a brother. <laughs> You know, because if there was that kind of favoritism and that kind of thing, I don't think it would last very long. You know, we're all headstrong women and we've been given a chance to kind of rewrite what those um, gender roles are within our family, within our culture. Um, and just to give one more kind of example and layer to it all, because my family is in the restaurant business, I find it really interesting that while women do domestic cooking, most celebrity chefs are men, you know, and you just have to think about what is that? You know, it's attached to kind of glory and ego and recognition. So, sorry men. Um, um, but you know, so these are things that are really interesting to think about. And so for my mum, Farida, as the head of Parwana, and the chef whose recipes are being cooked, and the woman who's still in the kitchen. Um, it's been really interesting because we don't have those conversations around a male ego in the kitchen, <laughs> you know, because if it's all of a sudden a commercial setting where there's glory to be had. Um, so I just think that it's really interesting. I don't think gender can be separated from um, the way the world, the modern world, the contemporary world has evolved. Um, and it really, the, all the layers of it I see in food. Thanks. Mm. Mark, um, obviously there are traditional roles, and I'd like you to tell us about those, but also, what about contemporary roles? Yes, yeah, certainly, as a people, we were hunters and gatherers. We still are, but not to the same extent and the same levels. So, like, for our men, for example, we'd, we'd have to go out and hunt. So, whether or not it was trying to get a kangaroo or some sort of birds, we had to go and get that where the women and the girls went out gathering. So quite often, our men would come home with no food, but the women had already got all the food. So they kept us going and surviving. Um, so, you know, it's a quite a different way of looking at it. Um, but like one of the things about the appreciation we, is appreciation of food. So it's appreciation, what happened is that we had our defined roles. So it's about appreciating when somebody was able to do that, whether or not it was getting the gathering of the food, or then we had some protein through some other kind of food. Um, so certainly today, things are a little bit different. So the contemporary, where we can, we'll try to hunt and gather. But quite often, there's fences up and people's properties that we can't go on to. 
And unless you know the farmer, for example, or whether or not, you know, even within going on to Crown land, whether or not we can actually go and get foods. It becomes really difficult to do today. Um, but sort of the people who know me, I'll go where I want, when I like, how I like. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's just me. I don't advise everyone else because I challenge authority. <laughs> but it's, it's such an important thing about getting to know your environment and knowing where to get things. Um, but we did have those roles. Um, I certainly, pardon me, I love what your role like. I'd love to be sitting back, getting served, <laughs> waited on. <laughs> Uh, this, I'm starting to enjoy multiculturalism. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. No, and we've left you till last, George, because you're the beneficiary of, of several generations. What about your life? Who, who did the food preparation? Who does it now? Look, the, um, the, most of it sounds a little bit like what Innes had to say, to be honest, um, especially in the earlier years, but changing very quickly. Um, the, probably the big exception to that would be the charcoal barbecue, definitely the domain of the man for the most part. Um, historically, I guess, you know, connected very much to produce where you're actually, you know, working as a shepherd and slaughtering lambs and going out fishing and so on. Not so much the case anymore, but that culture certainly seems to persist. Um, I guess the, I guess beverages were also very much um, in the men's department. So um, spirits, spirits production, wine production, um, something that, you know, I've seen a lot of um, people do in the family, but uh, quite glad that um, these days everyone's having a go at anything. Glad to hear it. <laughs> well, everybody that's on stage, there are degrees of trauma going through all of your experiences, and I think uh, leaving home because of war would be one of the worst um, traumas to experience and would leave indelible scars, losing people that you love. And I know that that's something that you have had to deal with, Cordelia. Um, I just wonder if you could um, perhaps explain how you think that trauma has manifested itself in the community that you left behind and in the community here in Australia. Well, first of all, I'll just say Um, through my faith as a Christian, I was able to withstand it. I was able to go through it all. Because if I can remember when the war was there, it was really intense. We see the too much killing. Before we make up our mind to flee to Guinea, I just prayed, I said, God, I just commit everything into your hands. Please make a way for us. So we had that faith without knowing anyone in Guinea, but I fled with my kids and grandkids on a local boat, which was very dangerous, but because you are finding safety, you don't think about what will happen to you. So we just fled to Guinea where we didn't know anyone there. And on arrival, we were staying just with um, one room apartments. We were seven of us, and the family that we stayed with, they were three, so we were 10 all together in that one room, sleeping until we were able to get our own place. But by the grace of God, we were able to survive it. And even for those that loved ones that we lost, we can't do much because in everything you just give thanks to God. So with the faith, we were able to conquer it all until we arrived here in Sierra Leone. Does food play any part in the healing process of the trauma that you have suffered or the intergenerational trauma that might follow? Yes, I would say food plays a great role in that as well. How would you say it, it helps? 
Uh, well, because as I said, we all come together as one family. We don't separate our food. We all eat in one container, and during that time we can discuss, and the kids feel free to talk to us, to me especially, and I'm open to them as well. So food was a great part of our healing as well. Mm. Well, Dakani, you've also got war in your background as well, and you've spoken about that sense of uh, uh, stopping the connection between mm -hmm. it. How do you think uh, the war and the trauma that has been suffered by your parents mm -hmm. and their ancestors before them um, has affected you and your sisters, mm -hmm. and how has food helped you deal with the stories around the conflict? Mm. Mm, that's a really big question. Um, and, well, I think one thing that trauma does for people that do make it through and do find peace and stability is it offers resilience. And it also kind of helps you see the future without any real claim on where it needs to go. And because you kind of witness and identify that everything that you thought was solid, everything you thought mattered to your identity and your personhood can be taken away. And that's not a unique story. And I don't think that's an individual story. And I think a really powerful part of telling stories of trauma is to collectivize it. Because that war and the death and the killing and the suffering and the loss didn't happen because of anything we did as individuals or anything that people who flee did. It happens because of collective, historical, and pol political decision making. So I think trauma needs to be redistributed in a sense um, because we need to be able to identify with it differently. I think we speak about kind of people who live in war and in suffering and in war zones as though they're separate from the decisions we're kind of making collectively in the democratized free world. And one thing that I've seen and lived is the duality of democracy. I live in a place where it's peaceful and I get to benefit from that peace. But at the same time, my country's government <laughs> is waging war in Afghanistan. You know, so it raises all sorts of paradoxes for you. And the one thing it taught me is that that story of suffering and trauma doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs because of collective decision making. And to be able to rewrite identity and suffering and, and the histories of what it is to be a migrant and a refugee in a way that isn't just about kind of um, this moralistic way of welcoming people, but a historical acceptance of responsibility of the way the work, world works and the way systems are constructed to make the world work, to kind of diffuse that responsibility so that the trauma isn't just a certain person's or a certain family's burden to bear. And I guess what that trauma, kind of working through it and healing, the role food has played in that for my family has been immense because it's kind of offered this bridge. It's a bridge from who we are beyond kind of these narratives of just war and tribalism and um, violence and terrorism and that kind of thing that kind of dominates the narratives around Afghanistan in most people's imaginations today to something really beautiful and immense, and that stretches far beyond the confines of our imagination today to a place where you can think about the flavors in Afghan food in a way that brings stories of cross-pollination and exchange to the fore, rather than domination and elimination of people. And so it's been, food has been this really powerful conduit for healing for us internally as a family, because our whole life has obviously, the bulk of it has now kind of revolved around food in a personal way, and now obviously with the businesses and that kind of thing. And it's provided this kind of tether from my parents' generation 
um, to ours because it's given us something to work on collectively together, a way to understand each other, even within my own family, across that intergenerational and intercultural gap, um, and also this kind of bridge outwards from my family to the community that we now call home to invite people in to heal <laughs> because uh, we have a lot to reckon with ourselves that we don't necessarily identify collectively as a community. And for people to be able to engage with the food and the flavors and the smells of Afghan food, which incidentally, so many people can relate to because of its position at the center of the Silk Roads. There's so many flavors, so many kind of ingredients that are very familiar to all sorts of cultures here in Australia. Um, and it just opens people up. It opens up their conversation and their heart and just their mannerisms. And I've seen the power of transformation and healing in food. Wow. Well, um Mark, unfortunately, there are very few Aboriginal people that aren't touched by an experience of intergenerational trauma. Mm. Um, how do you see food, and in particular, I guess, learning about the old ways, um, as a way of involving contemporary Aboriginal children particularly, but young people, into truth-telling, storytelling, and healing? I suppose what's happened is there's been a bit of a go at the bush food industry, looking at the different types of foods. And what's come out of it is some of our people started gathering some foods to sell to a wholesaler. But then what that came about in a contemporary way was our older people were teaching the younger ones how to gather food, how to appreciate food. So it's not about, for example, just ripping at a, at a branch to get the food. It's about appreciating that food because it's giving over. So they were teaching us identifying different plants. And so it was a new way of looking at it. And I think what I could see right across here is about that appreciation of food and valuing food is not just something we go in to a supermarket, get a box of something and walk out. It's a whole lot more than that. It, it, it is, and as I mentioned early on, it's right across, it, it's, it's a part of our identity of these different foods. So a lot of the learning and the relearning had been lost. So now we're trying to find ways of bringing back that. So that, that teaching and sharing, because it wasn't a done thing. There were periods of time in our lives where you know, this, that trauma is real on all different levels here, but now we're trying to find ways today of how can we bring that back. So I, I do some tourism and I, and I look at the different foods that are in the bush. And sometimes we have a bit of a taste or a, a smell or a feel or, a, you know, so it's about appreciation of what food can do. It's also, it's just not food, it's medicine. It's, it's a healing that's within the food. Um, so it's also then that connection between the food being actually being a medicine, more than nourish, so it's more than nourishing, it's nourishing your mind, your soul, it's nourishing who you are today. Mm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, it might not be war or cultural genocide, but moving from one side of the world to another and saying goodbye to your family forever, which is what your parents did, Enos, yes. um, George, what your grandparents did, would have involved some kind of trauma. Do you see that that sense of disconnection that we've heard um, Dakani talk about in your own family? Uh, <clears throat> I was listening to this, of course. In my parents' um, case, they made a choice. These people didn't make a choice. You know, so the, the difference was there. But ne nevertheless, the sadness was still there because when they came out, it was still quite a distance. You know, to travel back was a big, big thing to do. And my father chose never to go back. And um, my mother did once, you know. Um, so there was always that sadness because my mother never saw her father again. You know, her mother came out here in her later years. So, yeah, the, 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 the difference is there. The similarities, but definitely not the powerful, um, you know, wrenching 
that uh, the, these other panellists have. But I imagine sitting around the table sharing food together, as we've heard, is in itself a healing thing to do. Oh, absolutely, at all times. Mm. Whether you're happy or you're sad, yeah. food's there. <laughs> You know, it is. It's just, just is. Yeah. And the sharing and the unity yeah, that comes yeah, from yeah. that experience. This would be the longest without food ever. Having <laughs> all these people at a party and there's no food or drink. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, George? Have you, have you felt that at all, um, down the line, so it is, from, from your grandparents who came to Australia? Yeah, look, I think it's, it's probably a quite a similar story to Innes, but for, for me, I've probably seen the more positive um, side of it. And, uh, you know, my grandparents came to Australia out of opportunity, you know, uh, in the search to create a better life. And, um, yeah, yeah, they were sort of um, big risks and, you know, one, in one case, arranged marriage, hopping on a boat meeting your betrothed, you know, and that, that seemed to work relatively well in that particular case, but, um, <laughs> but I think um, for them, leaving parents behind, leaving siblings behind, the food was such a way of um, sort of immediately transporting them back to, to their families, and um, they only got the chance to sort of visit you know, once in most cases, and now I'm still very lucky to have two of my grandmothers um, with us at sort of losing it a little bit, but, f but food and family gatherings around food will always sort of immediately put them back in that very happy, happy place, so. Mm, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, I'd like to talk about stories because um, when you're standing around cooking together, it's a bit like driving in a car. Conversation flows because you're actually doing something else. Um, one, I wonder if you've heard any stories about your own past or the past of your parents over bonding, over cooking together, and if you can share with us one of those stories. I don't know who'd like to go first if one springs to mind. I suppose, as I mentioned about the way the bush trade industry is about collection, so those, it enabled us to tell stories to the younger people so it was those conversations about how this happened. How did they learn that? So just to, and being around food. And then, you know, like when, for example, a kangaroo, you don't just put the kangaroo in the coals. Um, it, it's about there's a way of cutting it up. So there's that appreciation. And, and so people knew what part of the kangaroo they would get. Um, another thing around the, the stories around the word we use is nyachi, which means totem, basically. Um, but like my, one of my nyachis is the mulloway. So our family can't eat that, but somebody else can. And so it's about looking after that mulloway though. So those stories about how did they originally ensure that when they went down to the Murray Mouth to spawn during um, summertime and then able to go out through the Murray Mouth, how did our people actually do that? How did, if that was your nyachi or your totem, how do you look after that food source so that it's there and plentiful, looked after, and it is not ex extinct today? So those stories could be told now in a contemporary way, whereas prior, prior we would have learnt all of these anyway through ceremony. Mm. And I imagine you're not writing recipes down. It is an oral... It's an oral tradition. Oral tradition. So the way the cooking and, and the appreciation of food, it, it is every, and everything about who we are, it's an, we come from an oral tradition. Um, so it's about that learning that is done sort of on the spot. So you must be paying attention to it. Cordelia, is there a, an important cultural story? <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, that either you have gleaned from someone else in your life or you pass on to your children and grandchildren through the process of cooking? Um, yes, like the cassava leaves. Uh, because the cassava leaves is a broad leaf. You cannot cook it like that. And as my brother just said, we don't have a recipe or cookbook, but you have to watch and be by us when we are cooking in the kitchen. Like the cassava leaf, you have to grind it or you beat in a mortar and pestle 
for it to get really fine before you cook it. You can't just cook it as it is with the broad leaves. And then we have another thing that we, ha we call, another sauce that we call like bitter leaves. As you had the word bitter, the leaves are really bitter. But you have to process it, beat in the mortar and pencil until it becomes sweet before you cook. So if you don't know all those tricks, you cannot cook those kind of um, dish. Because if you don't know, you will just take the bitter leaves as it is and cook <laughs> it, and the whole pot will become bitter. So you have to learn all those uh, skills before you know exactly how to cook those dishes. And we also have one other thing that we all call um, ogiri. That one is like fermented sesame seed. Yes, but there is process in doing it because you have to boil that for about four hours when it's cooked and then you have to wrap it up and ferment, ferment it for about a week before you can cook it. You can't just take the sesame seed like that. You say, oh, I'm going to cook sesame seed in my dish, no. So there are certain things that you have to be there to learn how to do it, the process of doing it. And what is coming to my mind as I hear you say that is it's the opposite of fast food. It yes, is, exactly. It, exactly. Is, there, it is a process, it is something that the, the, the earth produces which you might at first taste not want to have, but yes, through exactly. probably centuries if not many millennia, it's been used and eaten because that's the food that's been available. And it, there is a care, there is a patience, yes. as well as the skills involved. So that, it, I can feel that's just teaching so many different lessons yes, just in the exactly. cooking of that. And African food, it takes a longer time to cook than, I would say, the Australian cooking. Yeah. Yeah, it takes a quite a long time to cook. Gee, that's, that's a wonderful story. <laughs> Dakani, you live and breathe food yes. day in, day out, so it's a big ask. Um, but uh, are there any stories that particularly resonate mm -hmm. with you that your mum has shared with you as you've been learning cooking, or yeah. ones that you want to make sure that you inform other people around you about? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I would say that food is story, and um, I have the privilege of having written my family's recipe book and I've kind of gone into um, lots of isolation around the stories behind food and spent a lot of time just on my own kind of trying to read about and that kind of thing and apart from kind of researching it and, and reading about the historical significance of it, um, even in my lived experience growing up and around food, you know, it's, it's almost it is inseparable from story. It's a non-verbal narrative. Um, story is not always told verbally. Um, and just an example of that is the traditions and the rituals that food are inseparable from are the stories that that food is presented within. So in Afghan tradition, for example, um, we have Nauruz, which is the new year, and it happens in the spring equinox, and there are particular foods that would be seasonal, that are made at that time, that you would kind of collect, and um, you only make it during Nauruz, during the spring equinox. And, you know, the story that's in that is one of millennia gone by. So Nauruz is a Zoroastrian tradition which dates, well, there's no consensus around when it was, but four to 7,000 years ago is when Zarathustra is said to have been around. And he, his genesis, Zoroaster, was in what is today Afghanistan. And so his kind of the religion and the faith that he um, brought around is still practiced by people in Persia and Afghanistan and forms a part of Afghan cultural heritage and is expressed thousands of years later in these rituals around the hafmiwa that we make, which is like the seven, seven fruits that you soak. And it's only these particular fruits that you soak at this time of the year. And then I guess adding to that, um, there's this, um, I would call it kind of like this pudding that takes hours to make. Um, and again, it's made during New Year. And the significance of it is you take these wheat, these green wheat shoots that spring up at that time of the year, and you mix it with flour and water. And all the women, so there's, this is like, I guess the gender thing coming into it again, but women would get together. And it was just this great time to all be together and take turns stirring 
the pot. And there are songs, traditional songs, that are just sung at that time, kind of heralding in this new year and kind of asking for the blessings and kind of just bounty and a beautiful year ahead for everyone. And that's done collectively. So, so much of our food is inseparable from story because it's got these long, immense histories embedded in them. If you just trace back the ingredients, for example, or the rituals that are around it. And it's also kind of developed in a way that you bond around that food, around not just eating the food, but in spending the hours and hours beforehand, kind of really honouring where that food has come from and the significance of it in terms of nourishment and sustenance and bringing you together as like a community, as a family. So there are just the stories around it because it's designed to bring people together. Mm. It's not this peripheral thing, as Mark was saying. It's just this integrated part of who you are and how you express yourself. Mm. Mm. Thanks. Uh, George, I don't want to limit you to food because, of course, you create... Um, beautiful spirit, so uh, you can feel free to talk about that if you like, but is, is there something that you learnt about your culture, about yourself or your family through the process of sharing? Yeah, the, the absolute standout example for me is when I had the opportunity to visit my great uncle um, in, in Lesbos um, and spend about five days with him because I guess something that's a, a key theme that's coming out here is the the role food plays in creating time with people, creating a space to interact in a way that you may not necessarily have the opportunity to do so otherwise. So here was this guy who I'd you know, only met twice in my life, who's in his 80s, who ordinarily we might struggle to make sort of 10 minutes of conversation, especially with my sort of 70% Greek language skills. But over the course of five days, Every single day, we sat down to a three and a half hour seafood lunch, you know, a couple of one or two 200 mil bottles of ouzo, depending on each, each, depending on how, uh, how lively he was feeling. And by the end of it, he'd be singing love songs to my wife and all the rest of it. But the, the point is, everything that happened in between was by far the richest sort of vein of family stories and history that I'd ever had the opportunity to listen to. Um, you know, I learned things like, you know, my, uh, we also had one of my grandfather's good friends there on holiday. He'd been living in Adelaide for decades, but I'd never had that opportunity to interact with him in that way until I did that over there. So I learned that my grandfather ran away from the monastery three times. He wasn't particularly interested in the priesthood. He was a big foodie. Um, I learned about the fact that even though Turkey was only four kilometers away over the water, uh, my uncle had never even been there, and because of uh, so much of the, hi the historical significance of the conflict and the difficulties that happened between um, Greece and Turkey. And I guess, um, you know, the, that, that food and beverage in combination, like the, the ouzo was a great conversation starter, <laughs> uh, and the match of that with the, you know, really salty cured sardines and, and the octopus and, and the really tasty fish was, um, you know, it, it, it just developed in that way. It was sort of made for it, so. Wow, what a wonderful mm. experience. I think we all wish we could have it. Mm. <laughs> Ines, time was just mentioned by yes. George, and yeah. you would have seen a real change in culture, but, but tell us about stories that you learned. Well, you and your mum were in the kitchen That's eating right. your meals, That's not right. around the table, um, but what did you learn from your mum? Well, uh, you know, she made the most uh, amazing polenta, and now polenta is, uh, you know, in most restaurants now, it's just, you know, something that's uh, considered quite special. But that's how mum grew up, because her, her situation was that they were so impoverished they didn't see bread. So, and they lived in a situation where it was a, um, uh, a farm where there was something like 22 people living there between grandparents and uh, children and, you know, uh, little grandchildren. So the nonna was um, given the role of producing the polenta for lunch. So they ate that warm at that time, and she would dish it out, of course, proportioned, and it was the leftover polenta for tea with whatever was available. So whenever I see polenta now, 
that's a story that I remember, mm. um, that we just take it for granted now. And it, polenta does play a role in my family life. Um, my sons all enjoy polenta and we use it on um, special occasions because that's when we're together. And also other dishes of mum's, you know, when you're creating something and your children want to change the recipe, you <laughs> tell them that Nonna made it that way, oh, you know, like, it, it's good because it, um, it means you're connecting, you're, you know, you're talking with them. Um, okay, if they want to make the change, but why? You know, so it is, it's really important because you don't cook when you've got your family around you on your own. You know, the, the smells emanate and uh, there's always a reason for talk and that's only good because you talk about food and you talk about life and that's good. Mm. Mm. And wine doesn't help. I mean, and wine helps wine a lot, sorry, yeah, in uh, helps as well. those stories flowing, definitely. <laughs> um, well, we've been talking right from the outset about food and how it relates to our identity. Yeah. So I don't really want to put you on the spot, but I'd love to know if you had to explain to someone your cultural identity in one dish, what would that food be? Now, Ines, you've just told us about polenta. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll let you think on a, a different one. Mark, is there one that you can immediately say, that's me, that's, that's me in a food? Yeah, like the Kuron mullet. I don't know if any of be eating Kuron mullet. But honestly, if you eat Kuron, it does something to you, like, oh. <laughs> Like, it's far more. Like I said, I can't eat the mullah way, but I'll make up with it for Kurong mullah, I'll tell you. But it, it nourishes the soul. It nourishes who we are. And it, it's just the most beautiful fish. And everyone in this room who went, yeah, that's exactly, you understand. So really, I don't have to say any more. <laughs> There's not a particular way that you like to cook your kurong mullet that's... Yeah, I suppose what's really good is to mix it up with some of the, the, the plants that are growing, like the sea blight and the samphire that is growing on the kurong. So it's about collecting some of that and you cook it all together. Um, and that, so that salt, that's already, the fish is already salty, but it just adds another layer by having those plants that are there. Mm, lovely. Making me hungry. <laughs> Lucky this is finishing around dinner time. Cordelia, yourself, your identity in a dish. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That one will be my jollof rice. Ooh. <laughs> now explain to us what that is. <laughs> uh, well, jollof rice is the main dish for like weddings, christenings, birthday parties, you name it. Because back home, I would say it's expensive to cook. Because like in Australia here, we can eat meat every day if you want to. But back home, it's not like that. So people save it for like special occasions. Apart from weddings or birthday parties, but specific, specifically for New Year Sunday being first Sunday in the year, most homes will cook jollof rice. And on like Easter, they will have jollof rice. But for weddings, you cannot attend any wedding without you seeing <laughs> jollof rice there. Yes. So jollof rice is my main dish even here in Australia. And what are the ingredients? Well, back home we can do it with both beef, which is cow, because mostly we eat cow beef, and um, chicken. But it's up to you. Here you can use just chicken if you want to, or just beef, whichever meat you want. You can use lamb if that suits your palate. And then you have oil, you have um, tomato paste, Dice tomatoes, you can use fresh tomatoes and you dice it or you use the tin ones. And then you have your spice that you want because we like our food spicy. So whichever spice you want to use, you can use it. But for us, we use hot spice. We like our food spicy. And then what else in it? You can use like thyme, 
Whatever season you want, you can add to it. But nowadays, I see so many people cook jollof rice in a different way. But the actual jollof rice, go to Sierra Leone. Yeah. <laughs> Taste our jollof rice. Yes. Or to your kitchen. <laughs> um, Dukani, your mm. identity in a dish? Yeah. Um, well, so much about um, Afghan food is about that kind of long history of cross-pollination that has formed how the food and the cuisine has developed. And so I would say that an iconic Afghan dish is a dish called mantu. And it's basically just these small steamed dumplings um, that are... You hand roll the dough, you cook a, like a tomato, oh sorry, a carrot, onion, and um, if you'd like, you can put like a lamb mince kind of filling. You cook that all up together, you stuff the dumplings, and you um, fold them up by hand. And they look like these really intricate little flowers. Um, and there's, they're quite uh, um, symbolic of Afghan food because Everybody's heard of manti or mandu, Korean um, kind of a Korean dish, or all through Central Asia, all of those countries have their own version of this particular dish. Uh, and the spice mixes that are used in it, again, kind of reflects that history of exchange and settling in Afghanistan. Um, and the thing that I like the most about it um, is the kind of the need for it to be made together. Um, like Cordelia was saying, you know, it's a dish that's kind of traditionally was reserved for weddings or when you had like important guests around, that kind of thing, because it took a really long time to kind of make, and everyone would get together beforehand as well to kind of roll and make these dumplings together. So it kind of embodies that um, history of the mix of ingredients um, and that gregariousness and that coming together that, um, that surrounds um, Afghan cuisine. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. <laughs> now, for you, George, now, am I right in saying that you've adopted a vegetarian diet? Uh, mainly. Um, so, yeah, in years gone by, I might have said lamb on the spit or chagrued octopus, but I think I'd have to say the um, humble Greek salad, or Khuryatiki salad as they call it, which means of the village. And the reason for saying that is that while um, you might have had a lot of ordinary Greek salads, and I have too, it's, it's one of those dishes that symbolizes for me the importance of um, place and the importance of quality of ingredients and freshness. So the whole point of the name of it, village salad, is that it's a representation of what the village provides. So especially you have the local cheese, which say feta can be um, cow, sheep, or goat's milk, or a combination of any of them, um, and will taste very different depending on who's made it. And then often you've, you've made, someone's made the oil and the vinegar themselves as well, which is absolutely critical to the flavor, and the, and the grown, the tomatoes and the cucumber themselves. Um, so anyone who's had the pleasure of, you know, having a Greek salad in a village in Greece and comparing it to um, you know, a supermarket made Greek, Greek salad here um, knows, knows the importance of all these things mm. and the subtleties of combining those, those flavours. Mm. Thanks, George. Ines. No, I'll stay with polenta. <laughs> no. Um, no, polenta, if you do it well, and it's, it's a simple base for other foods. I mean, I could just eat it with, uh, with cheese, but then with umido, which is, you know, like a stew, an Italian stew, and could be chicken, beef, whatever you want. But what I'm trying to get at is that polenta done well, you can eat on its own. If you've got the right texture, the right salt, enough butter in it, you know, it's perfect. And then it's all the... But it's complex at the same time because you've got to get it just right. Mm. And I think that says a bit about me. A little bit complex, <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit plain. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, look, before we let you go, uh, I really just wanted to talk about the next generation because you've shared the wonderful stories that you have grown up with um, and that you're sharing with us tonight. Who are you passing them on to, Ines? Oh, no, my children and especially my son, James. Uh, he has an, an absolute passion 
um, for, for all things, yeah, for wine, but all things Italian. And he's still living in the family home, so he cooks in Nona's kitchen. And, and this time of year, he actually puts the wood stove on that's still there oh, and cooks on the on the wood stove. So, yeah, no, 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 all the kids are good, and the grandchildren. I mean, they've been taught how to make bolognese sauce already, so. No, we're, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, George, are you cooking? I, I, yeah, I cook occasionally. I'm kind of one of those classic, you know, you do one dish wonder and you'll spend a whole day on it and go, like, wasn't this great? And then not cook for a few weeks after that. But um, for me, uh, it's much more about the um, opportunity to ex uh, experience food and deliver hospitality through, through Never Never and particularly just looking for opportunities to collaborate with great um, regional food producers and and providers. So say tomorrow night, for example, I'm hosting a big fat Greek dinner at Yasu George, where we've made a, an Uzo style Greek Australian spirit um, to complement the, uh, the, the food that they'll be making there. So it's, it's a great pleasure to be able to do that. Wonderful way to hand on your traditions. Well, I don't really have to ask you, Dakani, because you are, you are sharing your food with us through your wonderful restaurant and your cookbook, mm. but others in your family also and yeah, the wider well, community? no one in my family escapes <laughs> restaurant <laughs> duty. Um, so the, I, I have lots of nieces and nephews and, you know, just gradually by osmosis, they end up there um, working. And, you know, I think it's really great because um, there's not too much that can anchor you to your heritage, like we've all kind of been discussing um, in our own kind of lives, everyone has this consistent story of how much of an anchor it is. And so, yeah, it's definitely something that's just being passed down generations in my family. And also, I've had the pleasure and um, the kind of privilege of being able to put that into a book, something that is oral tradition, and that has been passed down verbally um, into a book to share more broadly, which for a place like Afghanistan, um, that has almost um, exclusively just kind of negative connotations attached to it, um, a really pivotal um, thing to, uh, for me and my family, I think, to um, be able to have, have done. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those with us. We really <laughs> love them. Welcome. How about you, Cordelia? Mm -mm. You, you're obviously, you've got your daughter, your grandchildren here, um, and us. Are you teaching us as well about the cuisine of Sierra Leone? <laughs> yes, yes, I will, yes. And I'm very much proud to say that, of course, I passed it on to my kids, and I'm grateful for a wonderful granddaughter-in-law that I have, that I have already started passing our cultural food to. And it's no other person but Nadine. Can you just give them a wave, Nadine? <laughs> and she is, yeah. she is so good in cooking our African dish. At times when she cooks the cassava leaves, you can't see the difference if, if it's me or her who wow. cooked that dish. So Nadine, I'm so proud of you, well done. Mark. I suppose what I do is through tourism, and it's a great opportunity to share food, coming in forums like this. I wanna thank Vic for letting me be here and being a part of all of this. Um, so it's a forums like this is about sharing food, sharing our culture, and it's about opportunities to learn the, the ways of the old way, also that relearning. And so there are things that we may have forgotten about that now we have opportunity to do, whereas before it was we couldn't do this. And so to be a part of that tourism industry is huge for me because I get the opportunity to share what I know and then to learn from other people as well who are on the tours. And, you know, I learned so much tonight. Um, but there are so many common stories from all of us here tonight. Um, so that's the sort of things that... It's about having an open mind, about being prepared to share and being prepared to learn. Well, I think we've learnt that food is a universal language to all of mm. us, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to share. Thank you to our wonderful panel tonight for sharing their stories with Thank us. You. 
Ines Petriti, George Georgiadis, Matt Kormitri, Cordelia Clay, and thank you so much to Kani Yubi. Wonderful. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.